In this episode, we are discussing sex as metaphysical from chapter 9 of Leonard Peikoff's book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Stay tuned. So let's start out with a summary. So we begin with the point that self-preservation requires knowing that the universe is auspicious and that we are good. And not only knowing that, but experiencing it emotionally. And so we need to bring happiness at certain points in our life from the background to the foreground. And that's what sex provides. So the way Ayn Rand puts it is that sex is a celebration of yourself and of existence. And Leonard elaborates by saying it's a celebration of one's power to gain values and of the world in which one gains them. Sex, therefore, is a form of feeling happiness. But from a special perspective, sex is the rapture of experiencing emotionally two interconnected achievements, self-esteem, and the benevolent universe premise. And so for human beings, all physical pleasures are crucially spiritual. Like even eating, we gain relatively little satisfaction from the pure physical sensations. It's the union of mind and body that really constitutes human joy and that sex then is the ultimate union of mind and body so leonard puts it as no human pleasure as intense of that of sex can be dominantly a matter of physical sensation dominantly sex is an emotion and the cause of emotion is intellectual and so the clearest illustration of that he he gives some evidence but the clearest piece of evidence he says is that it's the choice of a partner so it's that Nobody desires everybody. There's selectivity involved. And this is illustrating it's selectivity because there's deep values at stake beyond just the physical sensations. And so it's what kind of person does a rational human being desire? It's somebody that who shares their standards, their moral standards, their self-esteem, their view of life, someone that they admire. And it's precisely because sex is so good and such an incredible source of exalted joy that it needs to be treated with respect and selecting partners on the basis of values and but once you have that kind of context once it's treated there then it's a real positive and the way leonard puts it is that you know you select a partner on the basis of rational values and then do whatever you wish together in bed provided is mutually desired and that your pleasures are reality reality oriented And then the kind of key point that's being stressed by objectivism in this section is that sex is good. And this is in contrast then to conventional views. So one is the conventional view that, no, it's not good. It's low. And maybe you can do it if uh, as long as it's for some higher goal like procreation and you follow a whole list of prohibitions. And then the other side of it says, yeah, it's basically low and an animal pleasure, but go ahead and indulge with it. Deuce is wild. And so, again, objectivism is rejecting both of those. It says this is one of the highest goods in life. And indeed, what Leonard says is it's what should come to your mind when you think of morality. This kind of ecstasy in the intellectual creativity and its root and the thing at its root the fact of man the hero facing nature as a conqueror, not chastity and poverty and groveling before ghosts. So I really just want to start out then by underscoring that last point. We talked about how the whole purpose, or at least an essential purpose of this chapter is to say, objectivism is not just taking a different view of the content of morality. It's not just a different set of virtues and values. It's a whole different way of thinking about morality. And I think Leonard is really trying to hammer this home with the idea that what morality should evoke, in effect, is not a scarecrow chasing away your pleasures, but great sex. So it's just, it's a universal way from conventional morality. One of the really interesting things about this section, and one of the things that I think makes it troubling, or not troubling, but difficult, is it's very assertive. So we get that sex is a celebration of the self and of existence, um, but that it's not really argued for. The most we get is uh, the kind of nature of the selectivity of a partner, which is definitely some evidence, but there's a lot more to say about it. And um, 
I think it, a great source for getting to what's the kind of philosophic thinking that goes into reaching these conclusions is in the course that I've talked a lot about in these um, objectivism through induction. And so I want to highlight some of the major points that Leonard makes in his analysis of sex as metaphysical in that course. And for starters, he says, all right, well, where do we begin? Well, we begin with that it's a pleasure, that it's the most intense pleasure, and that we pursue it for its own sake. And so that's kind of the starting point for getting at, all right, well, what is the nature of this pleasure? Why is it so profound? What is its meaning? And he points out that it's hard to isolate because the exact nature of sexual pleasure, because um, in the moment, you're not focused on the, uh, you're focused on very concrete things, right? It's the person's body, the sensations. And so as an aside, it's worth mentioning um, when objectivism talks about like sex is a celebration of oneself and of existence, like it's not like you should be thinking about that in the moment. This isn't advice on how to have great sex. The whole perspective is that you're just very in the moment and doing it purely for the pleasure. But now we're trying to get at, you know, when we're not in the moment, reflecting on why is it such an enormous pleasure? What is its meaning? What's its role in life? And so that's the kind of perspective uh, of uh, what's being offered here. And Leonard gives three contrasts um, if we're trying to get at the unique nature of sexual pleasure. Work, art, and believe it or not, an anxiety attack. So with work, the contrast is that sex, fe sex features you as a total, the world is a total, the kind of pleasure involved versus the pleasure involved in work is much more delimited. It's, you know, you as an expert uh, in a concretely defined field, right? It's the efficacy of Don the writer or Howard Work the architect. It's not um, experienced as you as a total person. Now, then art. Now, art's another realm in which it's experienced as a profoundly personal pleasure and is an end in itself. Um, but a crucial difference here is that your mind and body are not at the center of your focus in art. In art, your focus is outward on the world that the artist has created. And in fact, you know, we talk about forgetting or losing yourself in art, which is a real sort of phenomenon. And what Leonard argues is that, well, in sex, the focus is some kind of self awareness. It's you as a total en entity, hopefully not enemy, are the fundamental object of the experience. Now, you might ask at this point, like, well, what if, what's the role of a partner? And the view is that, um, that Leonard argues for is that the, a partner enhances self-focus. So if we think about the objectivist view of romance, it's that a partner embodies our values, our deepest view of the world, the things that are most personally important to us. And they, it's part of the pleasure is that then in them it's externalized. Those values are externalized. They're objective. They're something we can focus on and respond to. Whereas internally, it's our lives are experienced much more as this ongoing process versus a kind of, as like kind of embodied object in the way that you get in art. And so... Um, another way to put it is that love is experienced in some sense as finding another self. And so when we say that sex is about celebrating yourself, it's not as opposed to your partner and being in love with your partner, but it's that the whole meaning of the love for your partner is rooted in your love of your own life. It's rooted in your personal values. So then why does he bring in anxiety? Well, that's kind of the negative contrast and the negative or close to a negative mirror image of sex. So it's that like sex, it's a focus on you as a total and the world as a total. It's, it's generalized, but it's a negative, right? Um, it's a condemnation rather than an affirmation. And so some facets of that, right, is that an anxiety attack is, it's terrifying regardless of a person's knowledge, skills, character. Whereas with sex, it's you feel in the moment uh, efficacious no matter what. It's inherently 
an experience of self-affirmation. Or if you take an anxiety attack as experience as self-damning, sex as experience as self-celebration. So both experiences are generalized, they're not specialized. And um, the, because the self-celebration, again, is it's not like I'm great at a particular skill. It's that I, as a total, am good. And another element involved then, so that's on the, the self-celebration. But what about the benevolent universe premise? There's a certain feeling of the world, and this is highlighted in Atlas Shrugged, Leonard points out, where um, he doesn't have a negative estimate of himself, but he's had this uh, really awful meeting, and his view of the world, his view of the world metaphysically causes him to lose sexual desire. And so the, the point that Leonard is bringing out is that a person's sexual desire depends in some, um, in some way in the world that he thinks he lives in. And it's not concrete. It's not like your view of, yeah, man, this like the Trump's America is really lousy, so I'm not in the mood for sex. It's your is the universe hospitable towards human life or not is reflected in sexual desire. So we get um, that we get that there's two basic factors involved, that it's about self-esteem and the benevolent universe. You need to think I'm great and the world is great. And so the conclusion then that Leonard draws is sex is a celebration of oneself and one's existence. So I think hopefully that highlights some of the kind of uh, considerations that go into a philosophic analysis of sex as metaphysical pleasure and uh, highly recommend Leonard's uh, um, course on that, on objectivism through induction, to get a kind of much more worked out um analysis one of the things we've touched on this and when i talked about the inductive evidence but one of the things i do find fascinating is that the focus in opar the section is on sex not romantic love and that even within sex it's that romantic love gets fleeting mentions and i i i suspect that it's that leonard thinks that romantic love is mainly a psychological issue not a philosophic one and that the philosophic one really is one's evaluation of sex and if you think about bad philosophies it's not like they typically oppose romance but they oppose sex they oppose um, giving material expression to romance and but if you think about if you, if you want to understand how Ayn Rand views life um, I think you need to bring in her view of romantic love. So I want to say a few words about it. So the thing I want to stress, and I've indicated this, is that Rand sees romantic love, or what you can think of as sexual love, as the most rewarding experience possible to human beings. So from Galt's speech, he puts it as, love is the expression of one's values, the greatest reward you can earn for the moral qualities you have achieved in your character and person, the emotional price paid by one man for the joy he receives from the virtues of another. But here I want to really stress, when she's talking about values, she's talking about personal values, which are... Um, not anywhere close to exhausted by philosophic values. And in particular, she thinks that it's a person's sense of life that we fall in love with. Now, we'll talk a lot more about sense of life when we get to art. But for now, as a first pass, you can get that it's it's how a person comes at life. So here's how she describes it in the context of romantic love. It is with a person's sense of life that one falls in love with that essential sum, that fundamental stand or way of facing existence, which is the essence of a personality. One falls in love with the embodiment of the values that formed a person's character, which are reflected in his widest goals or smallest gestures, which create the style of his soul, the individual style of a unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable consciousness. It is one's own sense of life that acts as the selector and responds to what it recognizes as one's own basic values in the person of another. It is not a matter of professed convictions, though these are not irrelevant. 
It is a matter of much more profound conscious and subconscious harmony. Now, more technically, the way Rand defines sense of life is as a preconceptual equivalent of metaphysics, an emotional, subconsciously integrated appraisal of man and of existence. It sets the nature of a man's emotional responses and the essence of his character. So I think in that you can see the relationship to sex, right? If your sense of life is a emotional subconscious view of yourself and of existence and then it what sex is is in her view a celebration of the self and of existence and therefore that's the whole meaning of that it's metaphysical it's a response to someone's deepest emotional view of themselves and of the world with that said i want to say a little bit uh particularly about two wrong views of sex and romantic love they're really surrounding this idea of choice of a partner which is obviously a central idea in i mean in life but in um objectivism's view of sex so the first is like what you're looking for in a partner is um philosophic agreement that's the mistake it should be clear by now that is not Rand's views that sharing a philosophy is neither necessary nor a sufficient basis for romantic love so in terms of it being unnecessary like you definitely need some level of agreement on conscious convictions like I don't think that an objectivist could have a successful relationship with an evangelical Christian or like a woke activist again people who take these ideas seriously like if they're if a person you know calls himself Christian um, that alone I don't think you know says uh all that much in a country where you know most people are nominally christian um it's much less an issue of conscious convictions than a person's basic approach to life which can be more or less consistent with their convictions nor is philosophy or conscious conviction sufficient as a basis for romance and I mean, it's super common, and it's understandable why this happens, um, particularly for people who don't know a lot of objectivists, that you meet somebody whose convictions are aligned with yours, and like maybe you have some modicum of physical attractiveness, right? And then it's, okay, that's going to be a basis for a relationship. And unfortunately, it rarely works out. Because again, this is an issue of personal values, of sense of life. And there's no generic objectivist sense of life. Um, that is all distinct whatever your philosophic convictions um, but the second mistake then is that objectivism says you should only have sex with somebody you're in love with now it's really important to get when Ayn Rand talks about romantic love the the way she'll put it is that it means somebody's irreplaceable to you so it's much deeper and stronger i think than how the word often gets used and it is definitely not the objective's position that you only have sex in the context of romantic love and to get why you would you have to think why would i think that that is true why would i think that sex should be reserved purely for romantic love and i think in the end it's holding on to a kind of mystical view of morality where it's there's these rules for sex and thou shall not get it on unless you're in love but it, what you should be thinking about is well what is sex what is the nature of the pleasure and if you think about it as well it's a celebration of yourself into the universe um well then you couldn't have it with a person you despise or even some random person off the street, since you wouldn't know anything about them except that they're willing to have sex with some random person off the street. It's obvious that for some, for sex to be a celebration, it has to be somebody you know, respect, and admire. But no respect and admire is very different from romantic love. Um, there's nothing in the nature of sex that says, well, no, they have to be an irreplaceable value. And so, I think the the right attitude should be um you know view yourself as innocent till guilty like if you're thinking about like am i going to sleep with somebody it's do i respect this person am i doing this as for enjoyment for actual like a positive you know celebration as a reward or am i doing it to escape loneliness or try to prove something about myself and that's the issue it's um it's really about your motivations are you seeking a positive or escaping a negative? Are you being reality oriented? Are you faking? 
And so in that sense, it's like sex is not unique in terms that it has certain conditions in order to be a value. We always face this question with any pleasure. Are we acting from motivation by love or motivation by fear? I mean, we talked about that with money, right? There's a big difference between, yeah, I want to pursue a productive career and make a business that makes me very rich versus my whole goal is money, but it's really about proving, you know, that I'm not a loser, that I'm superior to the suckers, that I defraud and so on. I want to flesh that out just a little bit more um, on the negative side. Like if sex is good, if it is a profound pleasure, like why not enjoy it whenever and wherever you can find it? Like what is the nature of like what's the problem with that and the objectivist view is you can't get pleasure out of it that way and this is not like a uniquely objectivist insight right like this is this is what precisely what makes the kind of religious anti-sex view plausible it's that the so-called pleasure chasers don't get pleasure um they don't experience sex as an end in itself because what they're pursuing uh is not an end in itself so this is how um, Brandon puts it in his lecture on the psychology of sex that um, he gave under NBI auspices. He says, To the man who lacks self-esteem, pleasure is not an end in itself. In the most literal sense of the word, it is not pleasure that he seeks. Sex to him is not an end in itself, but a neurotic means to an end. What is his motive and goal in sex to persuade himself by means of the response of his partner that he is worthy of being desired to persuade himself by means of any physical sensation of pleasure he can achieve that he is worthy of experiencing pleasure to persuade himself that he is masculine to persuade himself that he is virile to persuade himself that he is capable of seducing a woman and any of his friends to persuade himself that his life is not a danger and a threat that he too is fit to exist that he is not a helpless alien in a universe where fulfillment is possible to him. Um, in a woman, it is to persuade herself by means of a man's desire for her that she is objectively worthy of being desired, to persuade herself that she is worthy of experiencing enjoyment, to persuade herself that she is as healthy and normal as any other woman, to persuade herself that she is feminine, to persuade the man to go on caring for and protecting her. So I really want to stress both perspectives because um, this is definitely an area of life where false alternatives abound and people will swing from one view to the other. It's that you need standards in order to get enjoyment from sex, but they shouldn't be seen as like dogmatic standards that are denying you pleasure. Rather, it's these are standards that are allowing you to get the pleasure. They're What they are is they're saying, if you want the effect of sexual pleasure, here's the cause. And that so long as you're taking seriously what sex is and what's required to gain pleasure from it, then it should be a realm of pure guiltless enjoyment. And that is the perspective. Um, so elaborating then on that last point, I think that objectivists, and I'm generalizing here, um, are still often harmed by religion in this area so polluted by religion. One if you think about the orientation of religion, it's all you should judge yourself and take pride and your whole focus should be on what you say no to. And like, it's supposed to be the height of virtue that, oh, I had no sex until marriage, which I view as ghastly, immoral, and really stupid if you want a good marriage. Um, or take what is, I think, more disturbing. I, I've heard more and more in the last few years from people like Jordan Peterson, but even a lot of just self-help people, um, a real anti-masturbation trend, which is supposedly associated with like strength and discipline, and yet I regard as deeply evil. For objectivism, what's important is what you say yes to. It's the values you're pursuing, and that so long as you're being rational, you're not faking self-esteem, you're not aimed at like escaping loneliness, then the real goal of sex should be not like what you say no to, but what you say yes to. And like how adventurous can you become in an effort to get all the pleasure for yourself and your partner that you can? And I mean, I think it would be a really good thing, um, you know, if people spent more time like l taking that seriously and viewing that as like part of my moral quest, quest 
is more and better sexual joy. So that's basically it. There's a lot of issues I didn't touch on. I know uh, one person when I was preparing for this video asked about, um, you know, what I think about kind of like multiple partners and things. And this is just a realm where a, I just don't have a ton of time, but more importantly, don't have expertise. And also I'm very wary of if you're going to make an error, I think it's a better error to be more permissible of like, go out and try it and see if something works, whether it's that or most other things in the realm of sex or in life generally. Um, if you think that there's a potential value there, like don't sit around asking like a ethic ethicist for permission. If you really think that there's a positive value to be gained, like go try it. You might be wrong. Like that might be bad. Um, and, and versus kind of like feeling like ethics is denying you something, but it's make sure you've reason to think that there's a positive. And that's really the challenge. One thing I will recommend, uh, there's a really interesting book by an objectivist named Jason Stotts called Eros and Eth Ethos, A New Theory of Sexual Ethics. Now, I can't fully endorse the content. Uh, in part, I haven't read the whole thing cover to cover, um, but I found it really interesting. It raised a lot of really interesting issues, and uh, he, he's a, 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 a really valuable thinker on this topic. So if, you, if this is a topic that's interesting, that's a good resource to check out. That's it for this section. That's it for this chapter. We are done with happiness, hopefully not in life, uh, but for this video series. Next time we'll get on to government. In the meantime, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and as always, the best way to stay in touch is to go to donswriting.com and sign up for the newsletter. Talk next time.